pretty sure your assignment three is handed in. The solutions for it will be posted shortly so you can start to prepare for the midterm. Also, you saw that, uh, notice that these assignments are very different than you may have seen in third year and second year, maybe even in some fourth year courses. They're more open ended, they're intentionally vague, and they're there because that's what life is like, right? This is a fourth year elective, it's not a third year elective course or a third year level course. So we're kicking things up a little bit, and it's intentional. A few people have been asking about some questions, asking for clarification. Uh, that's not going to always be the case if the question is exactly specified. You're going to have to make certain assumptions like you can avoid each question, pick, pick reasonable values to work with based on research and keep going with those values. Okay, so that's going to be typical in this course for the midterm and for the project obviously is, is very open-ended um, and the final result. Okay, so let's, uh, let's recap a little bit from yesterday. We were looking at microfiltration as our first look into the membrane topic. We're going to look at ultrafiltration today. So let's just start back here at microfiltration and note that those pores are in the order of 0.1 to 10 microns. That's, that's where the name is from. The pressure differences across that membrane, fairly small, 500 kPa, so half an atmosphere. What we saw yesterday is a bit of the definitions here. So we contrasted dead end flow, which is the filtration we'd seen up to this point yesterday. We had only seen dead end filtration, where we've got a regular filter barrier here, and then the cake is, 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 is doing most of the work. The cake is what's filtering the permeable part. In the previous part of the course, we called that filtrate. In membranes, we call that permeate. It's the same thing different name in the membranes. So that's my filtrate or permeate reading from dead end flow. For cross flow filtration though, we recognize that starting, stopping, starting, stopping, and cleaning out your membrane every time is ineffective. So the cross flow geometry has some advantages that we can get high fluxes through it without opening and closing our membrane all the time. Essentially what happens is we've got our membrane over here in the dashed line, and at this feed point, I'm feeding in my solids with some concentration. So we'll call that in our terminology today, that feed concentration we'll call CF. Concentration of kilograms of solids per meter cube is coming in there at that membrane. So here's my solid wall, here's my membrane, through which I'm going to collect the permeate leaving here. So we'll call that uh, concentration of solids in the permeate, we'll call CP. This is kilograms of solids again. So I'll just emphasize this kilograms of solids in the permeate per meter cubed of permeate collected. So it's the concentration of solids in that permeate stream, and that's typically zero. We don't expect both any of our solids to pass through the membrane. The pore sizes are relatively small and excluding all the solids. At the end of my membrane tube here, this tubular geometry, I have leaving CR, the concentration in the retentate. This is my retentate stream. And that's the number I want to talk about for a minute. So we've got my feed concentration, fairly low quantity of solids entering, and liquid leaving primarily through the permeate stream. So no solids leaving through there. CR then is clear going to be greater than CF. So we, we, that's an intuitive understanding that the retentate concentration is going to be greater than the feed concentration. The assumption is, and it's a fair one to make, is that in this initial small piece of the membrane where I'm feeding, those solids, this concentration CF, is the concentration. But very quickly, this layer of solids is going to build up here and 
pretty much stay constant for the rest of the membrane. Okay, so this boundary that's going to build up of solids on that membrane is pretty much constant for the rest. So that the concentration of the solids in this region over here, so this hypothetical region over here, that concentration of solids is pretty much going to be CR as well. So only for this very short initial period that we get low solids, con uh, low solids concentration, that cake goes, builds up, and then we pretty much get a steady zone of operation for the rest of the tube. And that's a good assumption that works for us. Okay? We can verify this in practice by cutting open membranes to see, to see that. So we get this cake layer building up, and then it stays constant thickness for the most part. And that's the shearing that's taking place due to the, the feed coming in over here. So these are very, very small tubes, right? These are not like big channels for the fluid to flow. And these are very, very narrow, narrow tubes. The flow is turbulent. It's lifting those solids away from the, from the surface of the membrane. So solids will get lifted, redeposited, lifted, redeposited, and on average, we get this thickness propagating through that. So the concentration experience here in the bulk of the membrane is pretty much what's leaving at the end of the membrane. That's a fair, fair assumption for us to make from a modeling perspective. There's only this very small initial piece which is got lower concentration. Then very quickly it ramps up and stays at CR. So if you had to plot concentration versus, versus membrane length, uh, you could build plot this visually that looks something like this concentration that comes in here at CF and leaves at CR. So is the, 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 the thought you need to have on this one. Is this for like a tube membrane? Tubular membrane, yes. Like when you have the member on the outside, that would just be the outside or the inside of the tube? You're referring to this more. like the bottom. Is the yeah. membrane? Yeah, this is yeah. So just for illustration, I've drawn the membrane to be on the bottom. But this is a tube, so the throughout the whole thing. Yeah, the, the material leaving is throughout the So uh, we'll have some pictures coming up in a minute. But let's just let me just jump forward ahead to illustrate that. Um, okay, so. There's one of those tubes. This is what I'm referring to. Yeah. So let's take a look at this illustration here for a minute. My feed is coming in in the center over here. Notice that this inner part, how small those pores are. That's what's causing the filtration. That's the surface against which my solids are building up. This remainder, these very porous openings here, those present no resistance to the fluid flow. The permeates will pass through this at all angles. So the permeate is leaving in all directions. This very, very small region here, right at the beginning, that's where all the filtration is taking place. And the rest of the tube is just the structural support to allow the permeate to pass through. Okay, so in this illustration, I'm just showing one of the surfaces. This is the membrane surface where the filtration is happening. Okay. In fact, like this, this solid area doesn't actually exist because it's all inside the tube. Yeah. Okay. Is there a variable for that? The cake thickness field? No, we don't try to quantify it numerically. Right? We don't really care what it is. We, we'll wrap that up in the resistance term. So essentially, like the the entire bulk of the inside membrane is just all CR and the cake resistance or the cake like thickness of the matters. Yeah, we don't concern ourselves with what that cake thickness is. We concern what we are concerned about is that concentration of the retentate. This yeah. kilograms of solids <coughs> per meter cubed of retentate. So that's that's going to be our primary focus in today's classes. Getting to that number and, see, and seeing what factors affect it. Okay, so let's. Um, yesterday's class we ended off with a bit of discussion on estimating the membrane resistance. Just a note here: this slide, uh, if you 
you have it in front of, there's this part that's omitted uh, that's important. Estimating the cake resistance, that's really just a repeat of the work we saw in the filtration topic last time. So it's, it's actually the method that you followed and you followed this in the assignment as well to calculate that cake resistance RC. So we, we do that by plotting time divided by volume of the vertical axis against volume of the horizontal axis. So that's what you did in the assignment too, and not comfortable with that. Okay, so let's now look at ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration uses, uh, uses a, a core structure that's more small. And we're rotating particles now that are of smaller size. So we're now going down to a far more intricate separation. We're trying to retain things that are on the order of protein sizes and, and uh, oil water separations. So very, very small particles that we wish to retain. And the way we do quantify this is we, we talk about the size of the particle being retained. That's our judge of the membrane. So if you're purchasing the membrane, you have an idea in mind of the molecular weight or the size of the particle you wish to retain, and that's how you can purchase this membrane. And the met metric used is the Dalton, so or more, more specifically the kilo Dalton. So one Dalton is one atomic mass unit, uh, one kilo Dalton is a thousand Dalton, and corresponds to something having molecular weight in the order of a thousand grams per mole. So that's how uh, you would we're specifying. We're going to see that on the next slide as well. Typical fluxes are if we're working in meters cubed per meter squared per hour, um, but more commonly is this set of units. Meters cubed is going to always give us very, very small numbers for our flux. So we multiply that by a thousand and we work in liters. So all the time, membranes. Liters the meter squared hour is the standard group of units to, to talk about fluxes. And we actually give it a name, L and H. Liters per meter squared hour. And more correctly, it would be liters per hour per meter squared. But the terminology used in the literature is L and H. So liters per meter squared per unit time, measuring hours. Okay, so you would get 500 liters at the very most in an hour if you had a membrane of one meter squared, that's what that said. It's typical, that's on the high end. So very, very low fluxes actually, if we're um, thinking of it in the context of filtration in general. These units are always operated in TFF for the vast majority of cases. And what's interesting is, again here, seeing the, the structure of these membranes. Here's a membrane that's been cast in one go, so we've created both the membrane surface, which is up here at the top, as well as this finger-like structure, which is only providing support for those pressure differences. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is cast in one single go. We can also create a composite membrane, so we fuse two layers. So here's my first layer up here, and I'm fusing it onto a more sponge-like second layer for structural support. So that's a composite membrane. So again, as I said, yes, uh, in the class, we're not focusing on how these are made. That's a huge topic of discussion and involves a lot of polymer chemistry. Our focus is on, for a given membrane, let's work. But uh, companies like GE, Xenon, they would spend a lot of time and engineering technology on developing various membranes. areas of use, protein recovery, so in the bio area. Let's introduce some new, new terms here, solute. Solute is going to refer to our particles that we wish to retain. It's almost always a solid phase, so we wish to retain the protein, that's our solute. Not always will my solute be the, um, will, will be a solid phase, but some things like in emulsions, we've got oil, that oil is my solute, the oil phase is suspended in water, say. Water is the containing phase, the oil is the molecule that I wish to re retain, and that's going to be my solute. This colloidal particles, this is a very uh, important area of application for ultrafiltration. 
Um, any facility working with paints, so they're spray painting cars or they're spray painting parts, there's a wash cycle. That wash cycle will strip away paints. You've got these paints suspended in water. The city will not allow you to just dump that into the sewer system. So the first step is to clean out these very, very fine colloidal particles in the order of micrometer sizes from the, from the water. So there, in that case, the paint or the dye is my solute. The water is my solvent. <coughs> Depending on what your, your application is, for example, in the paint application, you're interested actually in retaining those paint molecules. They're very valuable. You can recycle them and reuse them in your process. So many of these car spraying um, operations will recycle that paint up <coughs> to a high concentration again. We're going to see that today. And then actually your permeate is something that you're not interested in. That's going to be water. You may recycle it and use it elsewhere in your process again. But you really are interested in getting this CR, that paint, back to a high concentration, send it back and use it a second time in the process. We'll see this a lot used in food purification. So anyone working in the food industry will come across membranes, particularly ultrafiltration membranes, many, in many instances. So albumin in egg white is often used to uh, is processed through a membrane to retain those proteins. And then that's used as a food ingredient. Uh, whey. whey is the liquid that's remaining after making cheeses. There's this liquid phase after you've curdled it and settled out that solid that goes to cheese manufacture. But then the liquid that, that those curds were suspended in originally, that's extremely valuable. There's still about 12-15% protein in there. There's a lot of lactic acid in there that's valuable if you're doing this on a large scale. So what they'll first do is centrifuge out small fat molecules. So you've got this primarily liquid phase with small droplets of fat suspended in that, so centrifuge the fat out, go to ultrafiltration to clean up the proteins, the structure that might still be remaining in there, go to reverse osmosis, which we're going to see next week, and your valuable proteins get retained by this ultrafiltration step we're going to investigate now. Your permeate, now leaving here, this permeate stream is, is mostly liquid. So here in my retentate, I've retained my proteins from that cheese making process. My permeate though is still valuable. Permeate contains these dissolved acids, so ethanol, lactic acid. We'll send that to reverse osmosis and, and recover that. So if you're doing this on a large scale, this is about for cheese manufacturing, you can get a lot of streams leaving from the different separators, each one of them can be reused in some way. So it's pretty much a closed, sustainable cycle as well. So very, very widely used. And we've seen centrifuges already. We're going to look at ultrafiltration now, reverse osmosis we'll see next week. So all these unit ops get tied, tied up together in motion. The interesting thing that we're going to see in ultrafiltration that we haven't observed before is we can see these gels building up on the interior of the membrane wall. That's going to be new today. The rest of those terms are, uh, are familiar terms. Key thing, solute, is what's retained on the inside of the membrane. That's that usually solid phase. And solvent is what's permeating through. Um, and it's the liquid phase that's carrying the solute. OK, before we get into ultrafiltration modeling, let's just uh, talk about some of the pressure differences. We're kicking this right up here to about one atmosphere, so one MPA. Um, sorry, not, yeah, one, one MPA, yeah, that's one atmosphere. So higher pressure drops this time than we saw in um, microfiltration. What we will quantify our performance of the membrane by is what's called the rejection coefficient, this R. Or another way that we can quantify this is selectivity. So you asked me about that yesterday, Mark. So rejection coefficient is R. <coughs> 1 minus S is equal to R. So selectivity is that S. What is selectivity? Selectivity is telling me how my membrane can select between sending the solids to the permeate versus the retentate. So if it's not going out of the permeate, it's going to go out in the retentate. 
Okay, or if you re re rejig that balance over there, it's permeates divided by phi, one minus permeates divided by phi. So simple elimination, either if my solids are coming in and the phi, they're either going to land up in my permeate or my retentate. Selectivity tells me what ratio of that goes to permeate divided by my phi. So a membrane with a good or a high rejection coefficient equal to one is essentially telling me what's in the what's in the permeate. Rejection is equal to one. What's going to be my permeate? Here. Nothing. Nothing. Right. So uh, rejection coefficient of one is desirable. Uh, we want those solids to be retained okay. and they're going to be then rejected into the retentate stream. This is another way to interpret that. So higher rejection coefficients um, of equal to one is telling me that I'm retaining those solids and they're not going out to the permeate. So what we do then is we we can send a variety of molecular weights into my membrane. So here on my x-axis I can do experiments with very small molecules, 1,000 molecular weights, 10,000 or 100,000. So these are very large, complex molecules out here. So these large molecules we expect to be totally rejected. So in other words, the rejection coefficient is very high. They're retained in the membrane. As we go to smaller and smaller molecules, these will start to pass through the membrane and leave in the permeate stream, so my rejection coefficient drops off. The number that we use is we can plot this curve for a given membrane. We can go plot this curve for a variety of molecular weights and plot this S shape. Okay, so a, a, a membrane that's more desirable would be which one? The diffuse cutoff or the sharp cutoff? Which would be more desirable? If you had a variety of molecular weights coming in, you want to make a, a clean separation. The sharp cutoff would be a better choice because that's going to be, give you a very clear rejection between low molecular weights and high molecular weights with very little overlap in your out to outlet streams. So we're always concerned what's going to leave in the permeate versus what's going to leave in the retentate. So a sharp cutoff will do exactly what it says, will sharply partition you um, along that molecular weight dimension. And by convention, the molecular weight where we get 90% rejection coefficient, that's called my MWCO. So when you buy the membrane, you buy it based on the MWCO. What is the molecular weight cutoff for this membrane? And you go to GE or your membrane supplier, and you can purchase different membranes with different MWCOs. So um, can you agree that like, if you want to buy it? That's the color of like zero and then can you get like zero point five percent of the Uh so this this curve is for one membrane. Okay, so if if let's say we're dealing with this diffuse cutoff curve, I know that ninety percent of the molecules having molecular weight of hundred thousand, ninety percent of those molecules will be rejected by the membrane. But this for the same membrane. If I go find where 0.5 is, let's say 0.5 I come across and then I drop down, let's say that's 8,000. So eight molecular weight, 8,000 molecules, half of them will be rejected, half of them will go through to COVID. Okay. So it's one curve for a given membrane. Okay. So you buy your membrane and the supplier will give this curve to you, or you can ask for it. And then we see on the <coughs> lower than what you need, like lower than that, if you want like more than ninety percent separation. Yeah, so I mean if you let's say your aim is to separate hundred thousand molecular weight particles almost all of the time, yeah. I would then go with this with this thing. Right. Yeah. Because it's going to always <coughs> always get so you yeah, you absolutely shift in the direction that phases you. <coughs> Okay, so now let's take a look at this new phenomenon of gel buildup. This is a feature of ultrafiltration that we need to be aware of. So, 
we've got the standard equation over here. Flux is equal to my driving force divided by my resistances. I've got a resistance due to the membrane, and now I'm going to add this other resistance here, this cake build-up. I'm going to call this a different name. It's still a cake building up, but we're going to call it concentration polarization, CP. So in ultrafiltration, we get this concentration polarization layer building up. And it's essentially just a boundary layer of <coughs> the solutes on that membrane. Okay, so it is, it is nothing different to a cake. It's just we change the name up. And we're going to start to see that there's some interesting mass transfer that's taking place in here. So let's take a look at, at visualizing that concentration polarization. This vertical axis is the distance from my membrane surface into the bulk. So here I'm right at the membrane surface. Here I'm further and further into the free bulk area. So this is the vertical axis distance from membrane 1. On the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the concentration of solutes. So kilograms of solids per meter cubed. So this is a concentration axis. We're not used to plotting concentration on the horizontal. We're we're so used to seeing concentration on the vertical. So let's just flip our frame of reference here and plot distance vertically, distance away from membrane, concentration on horizontal axis. So up here, when I'm sort of in the bulk of the fluid, the concentration I see around me is CV, concentration in the bulk. So this is the concentration of particles sort of here in the general area of the as I get closer and closer to this wall, my concentration of particles gets higher and higher and higher. Okay, so these solids are building up against the wall and they're compacting over there. Okay, so just follow the blue curve, ignore the orange one. We get closer and closer to the membrane, so my y value, this distance drops. As I get closer to the membrane surface, this concentration of solids goes higher and higher. And I get to a point, CW, concentration at the wall. Now, what's happening here? We've got mass transfer starting to occur. I'm going to jump over two slides. Yeah, so let's go to this slide for a minute. So here's my, here's my membrane over here. And what I have is I have material flowing towards the membrane with a given concentration, C. And this gel is starting to build up against the wall. Material is also flowing through there on the other side. There is this material flowing out here with concentration CP. Now CP is usually zero. So this is the concentration of solids in the permeate. That's usually a small number, we'll call it zero for our purposes. Now, when we refer to flux, we've been using this term all the time. Right? It's the rate of flow of liquid per unit area. So meters cubed per second per unit area of the membrane. That's referring to this flow of fluid in this direction. That's, that's what the flux is. The flux is not what's going on here in the horizontal direction. The flux is what's passing through the membrane. So that flux J is given, is referring to that vertical distance. So material flowing in this direction. If I take that flux and I multiply it by the concentration, I can get the mass flow of material, or the, vol uh, the mass flux of the solids, or the solute as we'll say, towards the membrane. So J refers to the fluid's flux, J, 
Okay. Let's take a look at that. J refers to which units are we using here? Meters cubed of solvent per unit time <coughs> per unit area. So that's my flow of liquid solvent phase in this vertical direction, flowing towards the membrane. <coughs> if I multiply it by the concentration C, so C is given as kilograms of solute per meter cubed solvent. What we're in calculating that product gives me is the solute mass flux. So kilograms of solute per second per unit area. So the product of that now changes my flux from solvent flux to a solute flux. So this is the rate at which my solids are flowing towards the membrane. So I have solids here coming in. I also have some of the solids leaving. So if my boundary that I'm doing this balance over consists of this <coughs> illustration here on the board, I have JV, that flow rate of the liquid phase, or the solvent phase, times C, that's coming in, that's the flux coming in, and then I've got the flux leaving, JV times CP. So in minus out. So we're doing our net mass transfer of solids is this equation over there, JV times C minus CP. It's the net flux of solids for this frame of reference. Okay. So that's solids flowing away. There's this opposite effect taking place now. So this is the next slide. The moment we build up solids over here, so here I've got a very, very high concentration of solids at my wall. The moment nature sees an imbalance in concentrations, nature wants to push that to equalize it. So same with temperature differences, same with pressure differences. Same thing happens with mass transfer. The moment there's an imbalance in concentrations, or mass in this case, there's a, a drive to equalize that. And the drive is in the opposite direction, or from, let's say, high concentration to low concentration. So we have diffusion now. Diffusion of my solute, solid phase, in the liquid phase. So diffusion of the solute in the solvent. So we have a diffusivity coefficient that we can look up for that or compute in the opposite direction. So diffusion away from the membrane is a flux of that as well. So we call that J diffusion. So I have a flux of solids towards my membrane, and I have a flux of solids away from my membrane by two very different mechanisms. One is a driving force due to pressure. This other one going in the upward direction, the driving force is concentration differences. They will balance at steady state, and that's what we're interested in finding. Okay, so there's my diffusion of solutes and solvents, the diffusivity, and using the standard diffusion equation, I can compute that flux in the upward direction. And if you look at these units here for J diffusion, kilograms of solute per unit area per unit time. So J diffusion is mass flowing away. This one on the board, JV times C minus CP, that's flux flowing towards the membrane. So if we equate those two at steady state, they'll equal each other. That's what this uh, next slide, 37, is about. So here's my flux towards the membrane is equal to my flux away from the membrane at steady state. So no net accumulation of material. It's simply at steady state. As fast as I'm laying down new molecules, those molecules are moving away back in again into the solution. So as the one rate is equal to the other rate, the one flux is equal to the other flux, is exactly what it's saying. So equate those two terms, integrate from your boundary zero here, so right at the membrane surface, towards some height LC. We'll just go to some height LC into the bulk. Okay, what is LC? LC is just some distance into the membrane. 
So go up and at those corresponding points, zero right at the membrane wall, I have the wall concentration, and at point LC, I have the bulk of the functions. So my limits of integration are consistent. Integrate that, and I get this equation here where the log of the wall minus the permeate divided by the bulk minus the permeate concentration is equal to JV times that length LC divided by the diffusivity. Now, we don't like diffusivity. It's hard to look that value up. I cannot compute it. I also don't like LC. It's also tough to get. So I'll lump them up together and I'll call it HW, which is a mass transfer coefficient. Mass transfer coefficients I like because I can go look at correlations for them. So we now end up with an equation JV is equal to a mass transfer coefficient, which I can go look up from correlations, times the log of CW minus CP. Now what is CP? CP is the permeate concentration, and it's pretty much zero. Okay? So let me ignore that, divided by C. So CW is the concentration of the material right here at the wall. That's that concentration of that gel. So CW, concentration at the wall, which we don't know, divided by CB, the concentration in the bulk. Multiplied by a mass transfer coefficient, HW, gets me my flux, JV. JV is easy to measure. That is the flow of permeate per unit area per unit time. Yes. Why do we consider diffusion for microfiltration? Why didn't we consider diffusion for microfiltration? So these those solids that are packing up there in microfiltration they stay there. Right? They, they don't accumulate, they don't go back in. So we're talking about cellular products that will resuspend and go back in. There's a drive in that opposite direction. Because they're so small? They're small, they're, they're, yeah, there's, there's a big concentration difference there. The, the, diff, the thing is, we could consider it, but those diffusivities are so small, right, that, that this feature doesn't play a role in, in my equation. Is it also because the separation is way better? The separation being way better in terms of... Because the size of the here the pore size is small, yeah, so we're retaining most of the solids. Now, it's, it's hard to talk about it in that sense because in biosystems, as you know, or, um, I guess you're not in the biostream, no. So the biosystems, we've been seeing a variety of molecular weights coming through here. There's no way to say that all of the stuff that we retain. In fact, we saw with the previous graph of the molecular weight cutoff that there's a whole variety of molecular weights that will pass through for a given membrane. Okay, so what this, this is a common theme we'll see in, in membranes. There's all these mechanisms occurring. There's this concentration polarization. There's pressure drops that's driving the force. There's actually also, even in micro and ultrafiltration, there is also the osmotic effect taking place. Okay, but it's not strong. It's so small that we drop it off. Okay. So when we come to reverse osmosis, then <coughs> that osmotic effect dominates all the others. And so that's the only effect that we'll model. So the fact is that this concentration polarization exists in the other systems. It's just that those diffusivities or those mass transfer coefficients are so small that we can ignore it for the purpose of, of modeling microfiltration. Okay. So we'll see this here. Microfiltration will just use pressure drops. Ultrafiltration will use concentration polarization. And in reverse osmosis, we'll use the osmotic effect. Yes, um, using like, um, uh, the, like diffusion, like what is it diffusion? <laughs> it's the diffusion of the solutes, so these particles, yeah. in the solvent. So it's the rate at which those particles can move back up. So there's the simplified model that we will work with from, uh, from here onwards. 
assuming that the CP term is, is zero, which is a fair assumption. That's in, another way of saying it is that my rejection coefficient is one. Uh, it would be equivalent. And we can go look up mass transfer correlations through the Sherwood number based on the velocity in that tube, the temperature, the channel diameter, the viscosity of the fluid. We can input all those parameters into a correlation and get an estimate for HW. Okay. We can also just do experiments to, to, to compute them. Now, what happens is this gel accumulates at the wall, or the <coughs> concentration layer builds up here at the wall. And people's first gut feel is, well, if I want to increase my flux, I can just increase my pressure. So let's think through what might happen here. If I increase my pressure, I'm now sending more solids to the surface at a faster rate. Okay, so that cake initially is going to build up. I'm going to get a higher concentration of solids at the wall here if I ramp pressure up. So if I double pressure, increasing that force down, packing those solids together tighter, the concentration at the wall is going to get high. From what we've just learned from mass transfer, the moment this concentration is high, we're going to get an opposite force or I'm sorry, opposite diffusion of those same particles back up into suspension. So increase the pressure, you're going to push those particles tighter, get a higher concentration. Now I've got a higher concentration difference, a higher concentration gradient. I'm going to get an opposite force or opposite drive or opposite flux back of those solids into solution. So what we'll often find is that pressure has a negligible effect in ultrafiltration. Increasing the pressure will increase the flow of solute towards the boundary layer, diffusion opposes it, and your net effect is, is, is almost no difference. And this agrees well with theory. Okay, oh sorry, I'd say experiments will prove this out before, before that theoretical concept. So one way we see this is by plotting these sorts of curves, which I had on an earlier slide and I jumped over. Let's go back to this slide and take a look at it. Illustration is showing me what happens if I increase pressure. So typically we are, we're not operating at these low pressures, right? So this we're not in, the, in this region. We're almost always in these high pressure regions. It illustrates that for a given velocity in my tube, so here's six feet per second, increasing the pressure, like making it double or quadruple, has very, very little effect on the flux. So this is experimental. This is not theoretical. Proving that concept that increases in pressure have very, very marginal diminishing, almost no return for the cost that it incurs. You can get far greater effect to increase your flux by upping your velocity. That's going to get you much, much further. So don't increase your pressure. You're just going to get a, a greater gelling on that surface and a corresponding diffusion of that back out. So those two cancel each other out, so you get almost no, no improvement from increasing pressure. What you do get is much better benefit by ramping up your velocity to faster and faster velocities through that tube, shearing away more of the solids, and you'll get an improvement in flux that way instead. This is an important feature. Many um, companies screw up their membranes by just banging a huge pressure through their membrane, they cause this gel to, to be created on their membrane, and they just plug up their membrane. So as you can imagine, <coughs> building up this gel, huge shock, especially when you start up a membrane. The temptation is just to close your valve, start up your membrane, you whack all your material through there on the membrane, you create this gel, and it just it solidifies, closes and clogs up all your pores. So there's more than one instance of this happening in, in practice with operators that are inexperienced with the startup process for a membrane, will, will ruin a membrane, or just cause the company to have to shut it down, open up the membrane, and you have to uh, basically clean out and scrape this gel off that's built up on the surface. Does it also affect like, um, larger pore size membranes? No, so we're, we're getting in the ultra range. So, yeah. so like you really only get those problems for this size? Yeah, so in microfiltration, 
you can blow back air and clean out your pores quite easily and do a chemical clean. But for ultrafiltration, you've essentially built up that gel right on the membrane surface and it's tough, tough to clean. One way that you can some, uh, clean it is they'll, you can put these tiny balls through the tubes and scrape off the solids. So you can purchase that in some instances, but I mean, these are tiny, tiny pores we're dealing with. So they're really, at the end, you can, the best you can do is get out and scrape off that, or do a chemical clean. Either way, you've delayed your production by doing this. Okay? So, there's, um, there's several references that I've posted on the, on the course website. The one is this, this first one, right? So you've probably seen it there now. Understand the basics of membrane filtration. Written by two engineers from GE in April this year. Okay, so a great, great article to read. There's all of one equation in here. And the equation is, in fact, this one. Okay, that's the only equation that's in the article is understanding the key mechanism which we judge performance of the membranes by is that rejection coefficient. The rest of it is just a great, easy to read overview of how membranes work. So please read this one. In the references though, they refer to a document here which is really, really interesting and more practical. It's called the Membrane Filtration Handbook written by GE and that describes startup and shutdown procedures, it describes control loops around membranes, and more of the day-to-day -day practical operations of membranes. So that's another good one to read. Okay, so we've got this gelling building up on the membrane. We can go compute this mass transfer coefficients. Or we can go get them from experimental data. We can also help get CW, that wall concentration, from experiments. So no surprise then that when we see models for membranes in the ultrafiltration literature, the models for a membrane will be of the form JV is equal to some constant HW multiplied by the log of another constant here, CW, divided by C. So these two constants in blocks, HW are given, CW is given that, that wall concentration or gel concentration, and we can get them from experimental work, and then we can say what is my flux for a given bulk concentration? So if I have this concentration in my bulk, that's the flux I'll get, or, or vice versa. For a given flux, I can go calculate what the bulk concentration is. So what I will ask you to consider doing is just look at this next example for class. We'll take it up next week, but it's essentially a straightforward application of that, that model to an ultra-tradition. Thank you.